Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth session of the series Teaching Online. It's about teaching, not technology. My name is Jose Manuel Villafuerte, and I'll be with you today as a moderator, along with your host, Regional English Language Officer, Dr. Ruth Betzold. We will try to answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. We thank you for your enthusiastic participation, and we hope to see more of your comments today. Today, our host, Ruth Petzold, will be talking with our presenter, Cindy Spoon, about Google Apps for Education and how to make the most out of them to engage our students and organize our lessons. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. We're very pleased to have you join us again for this series. It was created with Mexico in mind but we believe it's also helpful for those of you joining us from other countries. It was created to help us now during the pandemic, but we think it will also be useful in the future because we hope you'll find you like teaching online. I want to remind you that in order to receive news about upcoming webinar sessions, tips and tools for English language teaching, please like the Relo Mexico page on Facebook. So today is the fifth session of the series, Teaching Online. It's about teaching, not technology. And as you can see on our calendar, over the four remaining weeks, we'll be talking about using Google Apps to enhance and uh, to enhance teaching and interaction. That's today's session. Teaching students in different age groups in a virtual context. Learning how to do classroom management, uh, differentiated instruction, assessment, and evaluation all in an online environment. If you've been with us in previous sessions, you know that you'll be hearing lots of practical ideas from our experienced panelists. So have you tried out anything so far from our series? We'd love to know what you did. And please tell us a little bit about how it went in the comments. And as those of you who've been here before know, um, each session uh, on Monday and on Thursday uh, lasts for about 60 minutes. We try to show you tools during that hour that can help teach, help you teach the way you want to so that you're as comfortable in your new virtual classroom as you were in your physical one. We normally have one expert presenting the material and with the support of a second panelist uh, from time to time. And I, as your host, We'll make sure that they hear as many of your questions as possible. So please do share them in the comments section and feel free to use the emojis as well. And for today's session, we'll be talking about Google Apps for Education. As always, we want to start with a quick warm up. So, what tools or apps do you use to share lessons and materials with students in order to make class interactive? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. Our main goal today is to make sure that you have ways to keep your lesson interactive, even if it is a virtual class. So in this session, we'll be exploring four Google Apps, Docs, Slides, Forms, and Sheets. We'll be learning methods for making lessons interactive, and you'll be learning more about how to use the technology to lighten your workload. And now I'm delighted to present our speaker today, or I'll represent her if you were with us in uh, our first session, Cindy Spoon. Cindy has spent 35 years working in the field of international education. She has a master's degree 
in intercultural training and advising from the School for International Training and a master's degree in TESOL from George Washington University. She's worked in higher education as a director of international student programs in nonprofit organizations, both as an advisor to parents on cross-cultural issues and as an educator in a refugee resettlement program. In 2017, she served as an English language fellow in Chile, collaborating with teachers of English to strengthen their curriculum, collaborating uh, with, excuse me, collaborating with teachers of English to strengthen their curriculum and teaching methods. She currently lives in Maryland and works in public education as a high school ESOL teacher. Welcome again, Cindy. It's now over to you. Thanks so much, Ruth, for that overview of my experience. I'm so glad to be here and glad that all of you are, are joining me as well. Um, we're going to be looking at all these Google apps that are available to us, and we will see so many ways to use them. However, I just want to say that it can be so easy to feel overwhelmed when you see so many options. I know I often do. Um, but I think the key is to find one or two new ideas today and then just practice them with a friend. Um, you can try them out with uh, one group of students and, and choose that group of students wisely as well. You might choose the group that is smaller or the group of students that's more tech savvy. And in this way, you can get comfortable with it first before you take it to all of your students. Um, after a few months, you can try another app or website, but don't feel like you have to learn everything all at once. So here's our first idea. As I explain these apps, I want to do a little experiment. My colleague Heather has created a shared Google Doc for all of you to use while we are in this webinar. Sharing documents is part of our first topic, so we're going to do just a little experiential learning. So the document that you will be learning that you'll be using is going to look like this. You can access it using the URL that should be posted right now in the comments of Facebook. All of you will be typing at the same time and you'll see that Google will automatically assign a different color of type to each of you as you type. Now, by the end, we should have a lovely colorful document to look at. So while I present, you can access it and respond to this question. Where are you right now as you view this webinar? So share your location. I know we may have people from four or five continents maybe. And later in the presentation, I'll go back and look at what all of you've created as a shared document, modeling a process that you can do with your own students. And though I'm not going to be able to give you immediate feedback, just the way this is set up at this point, if this were a real assignment that you had shared with your students, you would be able to do that. So go ahead and click on that link in comments and get started. I'm going to start my presentation by looking at the initial screen when you open your Google Drive. You can see the large plus sign with the word new. This is where you can find most of the Google apps that we will talk about now. When I click on the plus sign, I see these options open up. I see the blue docs icon and the Google green Google Sheets icon and the yellow slides icon. And if I want Google Forms, I can click down there on the more option and I could access it that way. But um, in the earlier webinar, you heard my colleague Heather talk about how it's even easier to access Google Forms just by going straight through the Google Classroom. And we'll look at that soon. 
But let's start with Google Docs. And again, I want to remind you that if you are familiar with one application, you can often transfer your knowledge to other applications. I know we talked about this when we were looking at video conferencing platforms. So in this case, it is your previous knowledge of a basic Word document. So many of the same tools and uses will be similar in Google Docs. So here is the toolbar of a new document. By the blue doc icon at the top, I can see that this document is untitled. And how you name your documents and where you save them is part of the process of making your work easier. You can set up folders by topic, for example, grammar, vocabulary, or game worksheets or you can set them up by classes or levels. Decide what works best for you and your circumstances. So here you can see that I have named my document Park Vocabulary, and now I want to move it to a folder. The Move tab is down here at the bottom of this list. When I click on that move icon, this window appears. I can see that I already have many folders created. I have a folder called ESOL 1, Classroom, ESOL 4, New Curriculum. But I wanna add this Park Vocabulary Worksheet to a new folder and I'm gonna name it Vocabulary. So I'm just gonna click on that little icon at the bottom. It's a folder icon that has that plus sign on it. And when I do that, I will be able to open up and name a new folder. So when I later, when I need to find that document, I'm just going to click on the File tab on the toolbar and then click the open option. And this window on the left will appear and there's my folder right there called vocabulary. So be organized and thoughtful about how you save your documents. This will make your work so much easier each year as you can reuse your materials over and over again or you can build off of a document you created for example, for a level one group, but now you can add a new grammar task to make it appropriate for higher level learners. And note also the version history option on the, this column on the right. You can always see each change made on a document. And this could be particularly helpful if multiple people are making changes to it. So we will look at why that's important in a few minutes. So organizing your documents will make it easier to share your work with colleagues. I do this often with teachers in my department. Um, you might do joint planning when doing a project with other teachers. Um, perhaps you co-teach a class. Uh, you can also share documents with students during a, a Zoom session and you can see them working in real time, which is, is what we're, we're modeling right now with that other document. And you can um, provide immediate feedback. This is what we um, are hopefully going to be looking at in a few minutes to see what you have added to that um, shared document. So to share a document, you need to click on that blue share box at the top here in the upper right hand corner. And when I click on that, that this other larger window appears and I can see that I can just type in the name of a colleague right here. And then I could share a document with them through email. I could click on the get shareable link up here. And in that way, I could just embed that link in Google Classroom or in another way to share it with students. So at this point, let's stop and take a look at our own shared document. This is our chance to get a feel for a real time collaboration. Wow, look at this indeed. We have had multiple people uh, add to this shared document. And hopefully you notice that as you are typing your name 
appears. So it's a good thing to remind students that working on a shared document is not an activity where they are anonymous, that you as the teacher will always know who is typing in that document. Wow, that's great. A lot of people have participated. All right, I'm going to go back to our presentation now and we are going to continue. Thank you for sharing that uh, little experiential learning there. All right, so I'm going to show you an example of a document that I ended up sharing with um, a colleague. So uh, it's this, a worksheet that my colleague created. Uh, she was teaching the same grammar point that I was teaching. We were looking at comparative and superlative adjectives, but I was using different content. So luckily she was willing to share with me. And since she had created it on Google Docs, it was very easy to send, to send me the link and then I could modify it. So here are the instructions that my colleague gave to her students. And I liked them, so I didn't change much here. And I particularly liked the fourth instruction, which asks students to read what all the other sentences are in this document and then help their classmates if they see an error. So students are going to be eager to read what others wrote, so it's a nice reading activity, as well as a chance for reflection and some peer feedback with our, which are both really powerful learning strategies. My colleague had provided maps for her students in the worksheet. And since most of our students are from Central America or from the Caribbean, this content was really relevant to them. And that's, that's a really important aspect um, in creating documents. However, I was using different content. So luckily it is so easy also to upload images to a Google Doc. So to do that, I went to the insert and then insert an image and I chose to search the web. And here you can see the box that pops up when I click on search the web. And I wanted an image that showed planets since that's the content that I was working on. And so I typed in to the search box planet size chart. And amazingly enough, there were lots of options. So once I chose the image that I liked, I clicked on it. And then at the bottom, you click on insert, the bottom of the page. And it was that easy just to change the document to make it correspond to, to my curriculum, what I wanted to use that document for. I thought you might be interested just to see what some of the students in my colleagues class wrote for their comparative sentences. So. Uh, these are students that are about an intermediate level. And notice there's plenty of opportunity for them to write about themselves. They can write about their families. They can write about the things that interest them. And this will connect a little bit to the idea of differentiation. That's a topic that we will be looking at more closely in the next webinar. So I'm just looking here at Michael, he wanted to compare himself to another classmate. I'm shorter than Brandon. Jason uh, used that map of Central America and was able to write Honduras is bigger than Costa Rica. And Luis, clearly a soccer fan, has said Messi is shorter than Ronaldo. So some really interesting sentence that students had created there. But what I also want you to notice is that the document is already formatted. So my colleague created a table to set up the different spaces for each student and for the different adjectives, both comparative or superlative. I just had to go in and make a few changes to make it connect to my content. And that's, that's a big time saver. The students were all sent this blank document and they shared it for this activity. So remember, they were asked to read all of their classmates' sentences. Now, when you upload a document like this that you want all students to access, you want to make sure you select the students can edit file option on Google Classroom. So let's take a look at what that looks like. 
here is a Google Classroom page. And I have gone ahead and uploaded the worksheet that I want to use, this comparative superlative adjectives document. So you can see here that I'm going to choose students can edit file so that everybody can actually get in and write on it. Above that is the option students can view file or below that the option to make a copy for each student. And we will look at uses for those options next. But before we move on, just remember the point of this example. You can reuse your own materials and you can share materials easily with colleagues when they're created in Google Docs and when you store them in your Google Drive. You just need to modify them to fit your needs and your students. And this can save so much time. And the longer you teach, the more resources you will collect. Here is one of my favorite activities to do with students. And this is a tic-tac-toe board that I created as a Google Doc. And it's asking students to write a verb for each image. So for example, in this first box, the verb would be read and then cook and swim. In class or in a Zoom meeting, we'll play the game with two teams. You can use a tic-tac-toe board for any content. To make this, you just open a Google Doc page and you insert a simple three by three table grid. And after you get your grid set up, you insert images in each square. Once I make this tic-tac-toe board, I can send this out to students as a view only document. So their first task is just to correctly identify each verb. So you could share your screen in Zoom so they can see it as a whole class, um, or you could put pairs of students in a breakout room. Uh, they can help each other in that way with spelling and vocabulary. So this is the really important step in making this a learning activity. You want to make sure you give students time to find the answers for every space in the grid. That's where their learning is taking place. And they're going to have fun playing the game. But we want to make sure we don't skip that process. So after two or three minutes of maybe pair work, discussing the board, the whole class comes back together again, and we divide into two teams of X's and O's. I think I've heard my students say this game is called El Gato, maybe in Central America, but it's tic-tac-toe for us. So let's take a look. So now students are going to take turns representing their team, either Team X or Team O, to win a square. So Team X has already correctly identified the verb dance for that box in the bottom, and they got the X for that square. And you can do this by using the annotation tool in Zoom. I know not everybody has that feature, but that's one way that you could set this up. Now, the other team has written the word run right here in the middle box, and that is correct. So we're going to give Team O that square. Now, you can fill in each square with a reading comprehension question, definitions, homophones. You can also write sentence starters or irregular verbs, a variety of ideas. The students are so motivated to come up with the correct answer, knowing that they will need to know that answer to win the game. So take a minute right now, and I'm going to ask you and who are watching our webinar tonight to share ideas of content that you could use for this activity. You can write it right there in the comments thread um, in, on the Facebook page. And while you're doing that, I will go ahead and just show a few more ideas that I have used with my students. So here's an example of taking um, content uh, from a, a story, a fiction story that you would have read. And each square is requiring students to fill in the blanks. So you can see we're reviewing the idea of main characters, the setting of a story, how a story has a solution and a problem, 
what is the title, the author. Um, you can do this also with a, with a nonfiction text that you were reading as well. Uh, here's an idea that might be more appropriate for university students who are studying to be teachers. So in this case, each square has a definition and the students would have to be prepared to tell us what the term is that's being defined in each box. So there are really so many possibilities for this game and it's my students just love it. They are so motivated and engaged when I play this activity. And so, Cindy, we do have some suggestions from the participants oh, on how they use tic-tac-toe. Great. Um, so to associate concepts to definitions, a little bit like uh, your picture mm -hmm. and verb uh, version. Um, I use tic-tac-toe to practice WH questions. I use tic-tac-toe for grammar to get the square. They have to complete the sentence correctly. Um, let's see what else have we got down here. Um, you could write letters on the right and numbers on the top. That's interesting. All right. Yeah. Wonderful. So. Great. Excellent. Thank you for sharing your ideas. Those ideas will um, be there in the comments thread for many other people to see. So it's really helpful to, to share what we know. Um, now, to save yourself time, you can often use the same tic-tac-toe grid for another assignment with a different objective. So here the grid is embedded in a new Google Doc and students are asked to write nine complete sentences, one for each square. So this time when I would upload this to Google Classroom, I'm gonna make sure I upload it as make a copy for each student file so that every student is using their own worksheet. So you can add the sentence lines as I did here at the bottom and perhaps give an example for what the students are to do. Um, and remember that almost any worksheet you make can potentially be used across all four domains. So once students completed their sentences, which would be a writing activity, they could pair up to practice reading them to each other. And as one student is reading their sentences, the other student could be pointing to the image that relates to the sentence. So it's a listening activity for them. So in doing that, this one activity has become a writing, a reading, a listening, and a speaking activity. Cindy, we have a quick uh, question. Sure. Maybe you remember the answer to, maybe not. But in your previous uh, tic-tac-toe grid with the lovely cute pictures, uh, we have someone asking, where can you get pictures like that? Um, that's a great question. You can go on to Google Images and sort pictures there. Um, we do want to be conscious about uh, choosing images that you're free to share. Although I have so a lot of Google Images have already been, um, I would say, screened for you. But we also, at least in the United States, um, we have this concept of fair use that most items are free to share for educational purposes, as long as there's no compensation um, for them. So you do need to be aware of that, but I think just going to Google Images has so many options for you right there. That's often what I use. Good question. All right, so another use for tables and grids is to teach students visual literacy. I often think of this as the fifth domain um, how many of us have looked at statistical bar graphs, particularly in these past few months? They have been so vital to our understanding of the pandemic. So we need to make sure we teach our students the ability to read and use this kind of data as well. So one idea is to ask students to question each other about any topic. They might ask each other for their birth month 
Um, advanced students might ask questions that are more opinion based. What kind of music do you like? What's your favorite sport? Um, here, students were asked an opinion question. They were asking their classmates about what their favorite fruit is. So this could be a speaking and listening activity in a Zoom session, or it could be done asynchronously using like WhatsApp chats. Um, and you can structure it for beginning students by providing them with sentence starters that they would use in that dialogue process. So you could create the sentences saying, what is your favorite? And then leave it blank. They could use it for sports or music or fruit. And then provide a sentence starter for the kind of response that a student would need to make. So after they have gathered the data, then they will create their own bar graphs based on the classroom statistics. So there's a lot involved in creating a bar graph. They have to have a title for it. They have to make sure that the choices are along one axis and labeling the other axis here, number of students. So I have found this to be a really challenging task for my students, but they like it and it's really we know that when students have to produce something like this, it makes their understanding of reading it a lot more powerful as well. So um, students could also be assigned different topics and later it becomes a presentation activity in a, as a whole group. So one student could present their findings about favorite fruits and another student's going to present their findings about favorite sports, et cetera. All right, here's another use for Google Docs that teaches a visual, visual literacy skill, excuse me. Um, and that is how to read a timeline. So students can make a timeline about their own life or they could research a movement in history such as the genre hip hop or civil rights movement in the US or they could create a biographical timeline about a famous person. It's really easy to create a timeline using the drawing tool in a Google Doc. And you are going to provide the rubric for the students stating how many entries they need to include on the timeline, if it requires an image or the use of certain vocabulary. I have done this with my students, this exact timeline where they had to create a timeline about their own life. And they were able to take photographs of family members or themselves and share them with me. And then I could load it into the timeline. And then of course, this can become a speaking and listening activity when students then share their timeline with the whole class. Okay, so we have looked at quite a few ways that you could use Google Docs and how you're going to share them and save them. And now we're gonna move on and we're going to look a little bit at Google Forms. Now, I can go back to the Google Drive as I showed you at the beginning and click on that new icon to get Google Forms. But it's a lot easier just to go into Google Classroom, which is what I'm showing you here. And I can create a Google Form just by clicking on the word create and then clicking on quiz assignment. Now, remember to set up your quiz in settings. In our previous webinar, Heather shared with us some of the important settings to use. You need to go to the quizzes tab up here at the top. And then you wanna make sure you click make this a quiz. You can choose options about when the students can see their grades and if they can see the correct answers. Uh, you can, you'll be able to create a quiz that uses multiple choice questions or short answer questions. You can insert images. In the settings, you can also choose to allow students to repeat the quiz. And I always allow students to do this because I have uh, learned that research shows that um, 
providing students with a practice quiz is an excellent way to increase their learning. So in this way, if they end up taking this quiz three times, their learning is going to intensify. So that's a good thing. Um, another use for a Google form could be as a getting to know you activity for students at the beginning of the year. Um, you could use it as an anticipation guide, asking students their opinions and knowledge about a topic even before you start to look at it more deeply. At the top of this quiz, I have typed the name of it. This is my verb quiz. And when I set up a question, there are some options that will make grading even easier for you. So the three dots that are indicated below here allow you to access a response validation option. Now, when you click on that response validation, you'll see options for limiting what a student can submit. So in this case, I ask students, what is your name? And I have asked them to write a complete sentence. And it may not surprise you, but most students end up responding by just writing in their name, Carlos. So by going into that response validation, I can require that a short answer response is greater than, for example, 15 characters. So this will assure that students don't just write their name, but write a complete sentence for this question. If their response doesn't meet that 15 character minimum, I can set a reminder to appear automatically to prompt them to do it again. So for a few more details about how to use this response validation, we have included a website in our resources page at the end of this webinar. But this is a great tool to customize your Google Form quizzes and let the computer do most of the grading for you. Now, here I have made a very simple multiple choice question. So the question says, what is a cat? So for very young learners, I might even just write the word cat there. Now you can add as many options as you like. And here I just have the three options. And you can insert an image as the answer option, as I'm showing you right here, but you can also insert an image as the question prompt. Let's look at an example of that. So here I have made a short answer question and the image is part of the question. It's not the answer option. So the goal here is to have students write a sentence using the present progressive verb tense. And I have provided an image as the writing prompt. So students might, you know, looking at this photo and students have to describe it, they might say, uh, the family is shopping or the boy is looking for his favorite food or the man is choosing uh, his dinner. So there are so many responses that a student could make to this. You also have the option, rather than it being a short answer, you would have the option of requiring students to write a paragraph as a response to this. So being able to embed the images is really straightforward. These three little dots on this image um, help you move that image around or remove it. So creating really fun interactive Google Forms is, is really an easy thing to do. And another great feature of Google Forms is that you can get this wonderful graphic based on data that you collect. So here are the results of a survey question that we gave many of you when you were here with us during the first webinar. So it shows us that almost half of you, 45%, have been teaching fewer than seven years. So we gather that data and then through Google Forms, you have the ability to make this beautiful graphic. 
Another use for Google Forms is to create a needs analysis. So here is a question set up using a Likert scale. So you can see here, the uh, information is right above here. If you choose a one, it would mean you're having a lot of difficulty with reading. If you choose a five, you'd say, oh, I do this very well. So you could share this with students uh, at the beginning of the school year. And once students has, have responded, you can create that cool pie chart or that circle chart graphic as well. And then it also quickly shows you the areas that your students have the greatest need. All right, so we have looked at Google Docs and Google Forms. We're gonna move on now to looking at Google Slides. So if you are familiar with using PowerPoint, Google Slides will be very easy for you to use. It's very similar um, app. So this webinar that I'm sharing with you right now was created using Google Slides. And I also use Google Slides to create lessons for my students that I can then share in a Zoom class meeting. And as you present to the class, remember you can record it. We talked about that in the video conferencing webinar. So uh, if a student is not able to attend my Zoom meeting, I've recorded it and then I can just upload this um, whole document, the Google Slides document to Google Classroom and they can access it later. And remember, you wanna be sure to check your school systems uh, restrictions about privacy when you make a recording. Now, here's an example um, of a lesson made for a level one group of ESOL students. And the advantage to building your lesson in a slides presentation is that it organizes your ideas all in one place and allows you to move easily between them. So you can add animation to show the correct answers. You can add links to worksheets. You can embed videos and music recordings. And if you are, you are on a de device that allows for students to annotate on the screen, you can make it an interactive writing activity. So in this example over here on the left, you can see there's multiple slides. You can have a question that embeds images. You could have a fill in the blank activity where students have to write to finish the sentence, grammar activity, and you can use the animation so that with one click, it'll show what the correct answer is or multiple choice, you could animate that by having it circle the correct choice. And your whole lesson is organized for you here in one place. A great use of Google Slides is also as a collaborative task for small groups. You can assign each group one slide. Now, this could be done in a breakout room during a Zoom session, or it could be an activity that's done asynchronously at home on their own time. But you can control what the topic is. So, for example, if researching the current wave of protests will really engage your students, make some of the requirements tie into your curriculum in other ways. You could provide a rubric so students know what is the goal. Are you teaching about plagiarism? Are you teaching the skill of summarizing? Or do you want students to just be able to write a clear sentence with subject verb agreement? So you can decide what the focus is for the activity. And in this assignment, small groups of students were assigned a different continent to research. You can see that on the slides on the left. After the groups completed their slide, they could come together as a whole class and give presentations. You might require students who are listening to the presentation to fill out a chart with a fact from each slide. 
This holds all students accountable for practicing their English skills when only one student is speaking. Here's another collaborative task that could be for a whole class, or you could have different students assigned to small groups. So young learners could practice the idea of recognizing letters and sounds. This could be done at home with the help of, of parents. They could offer young students a choice of images that have been labeled, for example, and the students need to find the words that begin with the correct letter and then upload them to their slide. A similar idea for older learners might be to create a, a glossary based on a shared text. Again, this could be either a fiction or a nonfiction text. And this would require some critical thinking skills to justify a word's use in the glossary. Why is it important enough to the text that it should be in the glossary. Students could write in the speaker's notes their reasons for using it. Again, there are so many ways to make your lessons interactive using Google Slides. Okay, let's move on to Google Sheets. So this is similar to Excel a popular spreadsheet program. And when I click on the new icon on my homepage in Google Drive, remember that first image, and I select Sheets, I can see the option for a blank page or I can choose a template that Google Sheets has already set up for me. So here are some of those options for templates. You can see that they actually have a category for education. So I could make a sheets document for attendance. I could do a grade book, an assignment tracker. You could use it to make schedules or a to-do list. And you can also use sheets for budgets and more business related needs too. So Google Sheets is again, just, just a spreadsheet and it is where you can gather data results from a quiz using forms. Here is the example of the data we collected from our survey that was done during the first webinar. If you remember that we shared a form, a Google form with all of you then. Um, you can also use it uh, to create rubrics or you could uh, use a Google Sheets document to collect links for, for projects like a digital portfolio that you want to share with students where you already had links ready for them to use for their research. Here Google Sheets has been used as a sign up sheet for end of year conferences with students and you could use it for a field trip sign up sheet. Here's another really wonderful way to use sheets. You can create spelling lists and other word games using an app called flippity.net. So there's a link to this resource at the end of our presentation. We created a little resources page. So you would be able to um, create a separate list depending on uh, what a student is studying. Let's say each of these students may have been reading a different book and there was certain vocabulary in the book that they were expected to use later in their summary. You could create a separate spelling vocabulary list for each of your students. So that's a really fun resource to look at. So we have now looked at the four um, apps that are there accessible to you at Google Drive. We're gonna look at just a few more ideas um, that you can use with Google. And this one is looking at YouTube. So many of you have used YouTube, you're very familiar with it. And I'm sure you all have some interesting ideas that you have done as well using YouTube. So I'm just gonna share two with you. And 
as you're watching this, maybe you could write again in that comments uh, section, some of the things you have done with YouTube. YouTube is actually owned now by, by Google. So that's why I'm going to share it in this webinar. So here's a really easy example. You take the lyrics from a song and you turn it into a closed activity where students have to fill in the missing word. Here's a great song by James Taylor. So one of the things you can do is focus on the concept of rhyming, which is a foundational reading skill. So you would leave off that final word, particularly pointing out to students that it should rhyme. So in this case, the first line says, don't know much about history, don't know much, and the missing word is biology. Don't know much about a science book, don't know much about the French eye. Anybody think they know the word that's missing there? But I do know that I love you, and I know that if you love me, blank. And again, it's going to have to rhyme with you. What a wonderful world this would be. All right, I'm going to now show you one of my all time favorite educational websites. It's called Ed Puzzle. I heard somebody mention this on Thursday's webinar that they use this site, but I did not see many mentions of it in that initial um, Google's form survey that we sent out. So Ed Puzzles, this great website, it's free. And you can see right here, it allows you to upload and embed YouTube videos. So when you do that, you choose a video, then you can go in and embed multiple choice questions or open-ended questions into that video. You can even take a video and you can add your own voice to it. There are also plenty of resources already made by other teachers that you can use. And that's a real time saver. That's found up here under that curriculum. My students really enjoy this because, I mean, let's face it, most students just enjoy watching videos. So they can go in and they listen to the video. It'll stop at certain points and ask them comprehension questions or grammar questions, whatever you decide you want to connect it to. And Edpuzzle grades it for you, another great time saver. Um, but you can also allow students, once again, to repeat this activity. So they're getting the chance to really review. These videos are then listening activities, they are reading activities, they are writing activities. You can ask students to summarize a story they watched, and then it could even be a speaking exercise if they shared that summary in the whole group. Um, you can embed the link to the Edpuzzle activity right into Google Classroom as an assignment. Um, you can also create your own YouTube channel to upload videos that you make to flip your classroom. And again, when you do this, you wanna be sure to set security settings that you control who has access to them. And be sure that if you use images with students, you've gotten the proper consent and release form signed. So, so many possibilities with YouTube, what you can do with that. So there we are, we have finished all of those. And I am just going to mention very briefly a few other apps that um, are great for education, but I didn't feel like we had to, time to explore these too deeply, but I'm just going to mention them here. Google Maps. This is wonderful. You can make scavenger hunts with that. I have created one that's in the resource page just with just a few questions just to give you the idea of what that's about. The Arts and Culture app allows you to go visit museums all over the world. Sites is a Google app where you can create your own website. And then Earth, another Google app that allows you to zoom in on a country, a village, all over the world. You can go visiting places. Lots of interactive fun things you could do with those. 
So here's the resource page I mentioned earlier. Here's the link to the Flippity. Um, here's a nice tutorial about how to make rubrics um, using sheets. Uh, some more ideas about those settings I mentioned in Google Forms. And at the bottom is the link to the scavenger hunt that I created. So I hope you'll take time to look them over and explore all the possibilities for creating interactive, exciting learning experiences for your students and take advantage of the time-saving aspects of sharing docs and using apps that do much of the work for you. So I hope you have learned a few new ideas from our webinar. And now I will turn the microphone back to Ruth. Thank you. Wow, wow, thank you, Cindy. Um, that was terrific. I, uh, I'm sure we all feel enlightened about Google Apps at this point. It's great to have so many options for fostering student uh, cooperation and interaction and for lightening our workload. Um, so we are almost finished for today. We have one more thing to ask you. We don't want to keep these treasures just for ourselves. So please share some of the ideas you heard today or maybe even the whole video on social media or with your colleagues. And as you've heard me say in previous um, webinars, uh, one great way to do that is by hosting a watch party on Facebook. Um, to do that, you are going to start a post. When the box pops up, you can see the little yellow arrow pointing to the three dots at the bottom. Click on that, which will allow you to choose uh, this video. And when you hit publish, your friends will get a notification that you would like them to watch this video with you. And then of course you can do uh, what you want to do, stopping along the way to reflect or watch it all the way through and discuss at the end. So um, yes, Cindy. I believe you're going to tell us also what we'll be talking about next time. Indeed, I will be co-presenting next the next webinar with my colleague, Wendy Colson, and we're going to be looking at some important aspects of classroom management, even though we're teaching online. And we're also going to be looking at ways to differentiate our instruction. So I hope you will come back and join us again on June 11th for that webinar. Excellent. Thank you, Cindy. And we want to say thank you once again to uh, everyone who joined us today for all of your comments, your, uh, your emoticons, and uh, for participating in the shared doc. That was great. Um, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. That's June 11th at four o'clock in the afternoon, Mexico City time here on the Facebook page of Relo Mexico. Until then, stay home and stay safe. Bye-bye.